by Raymond Nielsen. Today is the second day of our lesson. So, I would like to request you to watch the previous video so that you can enjoy this video without any difficulty. In the previous video, we discussed the first two stanzas in detail. In this video, we are going to discuss the next two stanzas and the poetic techniques as well. Before we start the third stanza, let's have a look at the first two stanzas. In the first two stanzas, we come across a person called he and another group of people called they. So the first stanza divides the people in the society into two. He is a non-believer of course. They are believers of course. They are timid, superstitious and they have no confidence so that they accept all the ghost stories. He is a non-believer, he does not believe in ghosts and he is pretty confident that ghosts do not exist. So that he needs to get a chance to prove that there are no ghosts. He needs to prove that the not believers are superstitious. So he gives them a challenge. So he wants them to give him, a, him an opportunity to stay in this house which is said to be haunted. So that is going to prove there are no ghosts in the house. In the poem, he humiliates the believers. He humiliates the ghost. He is overconfident about what he believes. This suggests that the poem is about a kind of a huge confrontation between man and the ghost. In the second stanza, the writer generates a gothic atmosphere. A dark, gloomy, with screech owl calling and the hunchback. With all these things, he generates a gothic atmosphere in the place where he is. So the non-believer is left in the house so that he is supposed to spend the night alone. When the darkness falls, he experiences something that he never expected to witness. But the non-believer is pretty confident. In the second stanza, even though the ghostly experiences have been ex uh, witnessed by this non-believer, he is ready to combat the situation. That is what we observe in the first two stanzas. Let's have a look at the third stanza. Come, come, it's very nervous, he said, but just the same, he draws the curtain. The stroke of twelve, but there's no clock. He shuts the door and turns the lock. Of course, he knows that there's no one there, but no harm's done by taking care. Someone outside, silly joker, he may as well pick up the book. When you look at this stanza, you realize that certain lines are within brackets. The lines within brackets show the narrator's interference into the story. So from time to time, the narrator comes out into the poem and he develops or he gives the situation or he describes the situation in detail but just the same he draws the curtain sometimes the narrator describes a situation sometimes the narrator presents the inner feelings of the non-believer so the narrator's presence of the poem can be seen from time to time come come it's merely nervous so what happens is something is happening to the non-believer within himself Come, come, it's very nervous. So when you hear a certain unexpected sound at night, you become nervous. So as the non-believer becomes nervous. When he becomes nervous, 
he tries to reassure himself because he is pretty confident about himself. He is pretty confident of the idea that there are no ghosts. The ghosts do not exist. So that he, though he becomes nervous, he says, okay, come, come, it's very nervous. He was certain. What was he certain? He was certain that the ghosts do not exist. So he believes his idea. He was certain. But just the same, what does he do? He draws the curtain. Even though he does not believe in ghosts, the things which happen at this moment are capable enough to shake his confidence. So that is why he draws the curtain. He draws the curtain because he may have started losing his confidence. Though he is overconfident about himself, though he believes that the ghosts do not exist, the things that happen at this moment makes him nervous. So he begins to lose his confidence. So that is why he draws the curtain. Certain curtain, there is a contradiction between these two lines. When you observe these two lines, there is a contradiction. He is certain that there are no ghosts, but he draws the curtain in order to avoid any kind of happenings in time to come. So there is a contradiction and this contradiction, contradiction of what he believes and what he does gives us the idea that he has begun to lose his confidence. The stroke of 12, but there's no clock. So what will happen to you and I if we were there? If we were in his shoes, we would surely be scared. Because there's no clock in the house, but the clock strikes 12. You know, 12 o'clock midnight is associated with supernatural figures, ghostly happenings. So we all, within our mind, we all have a kind of a fear to face this time, 12 o'clock midnight, if we are specially alone. So the stroke of 12 without a clock shakes his confidence. He shuts, shuts the door and turns the lock. Why does he lock the door? He locks the door because he loses his confidence. He feels fear. He locks the door in order to stop any kind of supernatural figure or anybody entering into the house. So that means he was left in this place in the evening and within these 4-5 hours, he, because of the things he has faced, he has lost his confidence. And finally, the way he reacts when there was no clock and it strikes 12 shows that he has lost his confidence and is trying to protect himself. But no harm is done by taking care. Yes, he is trying to reassure himself. Nobody is there. Don't worry about it. There are no ghosts at all. He knows that something is happening. But he is trying to reassure himself. In the last two lines of this stanza, we realize that he introduces the person who is making some noise outside as a silly joker. But remember, why does he pick up the poker, a kind of a weapon, to attack the silly joker if he is not afraid? This shows that he is afraid. So the third stanza shows an internal conflict within this non-believer. What is this internal conflict? At the beginning of the poem, he does not believe in ghosts. He does not accept the idea that ghosts do exist. So here, in this stanza, we understand that from step by step, he is losing his confidence. So in the end, he has lost his confidence completely. So that he is trying to get a kind of a weapon into his hand in order to attack the so-called ghost or the silly joker. If he is not afraid of silly joker, why does he take a weapon? 
From these incidents, we understand that his internal conflict. What is the internal conflict? He does not believe in ghosts, but the things that are happening in this house from time to time makes him believe. He is forced to believe, but he does not want to believe. He is forced, he does not want. This conflict is there within himself. Finally, he takes the weapon into his hand because he has lost his confidence and now he is trying to protect his life, safeguard himself. Now, the situation has occurred that he can no longer proceed in the way that he has been behaving at the beginning because the things which are happening shows that there is a, the house could be a haunted place of a ghost. This sansa shows the speaker's mental agitation, the non-believer's mental agitation. That is what I told you as mental conflict or internal conflict. He does not want to believe but he is forced to believe. So that is why he draws the curtain. That is why he locks the door. That is why he takes a weapon into his hand because he gets the feeling that somebody or someone invisible is available within his proximity. Close to him, within the house or outside the house, there seems to be someone invisible, a kind of a supernatural figure within his proximity. So that is why he begins to lose his confidence. Once when he began to lose his confidence, dramatically his confidence falls. His confidence falls. He cannot stop it. Even though he tries to reassure himself, saying various things, he cannot do that. So finally, he takes the weapon into his hand. No harm is done by taking care, shows his pretentious behavior. He pretentiously behaved that he is pretty confident as well as in the beginning of the poem but he no longer can hold his confidence with himself because he takes a weapon to attack the silly joker. So in this stanza we understand very we understand that he has completely lost his confidence and no longer he is able to fight back. That noise again, he checks the door. He has already locked the door. He shuts the door and turns the lock in the previous stanza. But in this stanza, he checks the door again. Why does he check the door if he is confident that the goods do not exist? He checks the door because he has by now, he has completely lost his confidence. He is no longer confident of what he believed at the beginning. Now, the, the mentality of this non-believer has taken an 180 degrees turn. Earlier, he did not believe in ghosts. Now, the situation or the things happening at this moment makes him to believe what he did not believe. That means, he is forced to believe. He shutters the window makes a pose to seek the safest place to hide. Now, he has given up his fight to prove that there are no ghosts. Now, he has lost it. He has given up his fight. He has completely lost it. So, he is trying to find a suitable place to hide. What for? To protect himself. So, he has become one like them. One like you and I. Right? He has completely given up his fight. He was overconfident at the beginning. The people, those who become overconfident, face this situation. We have hundreds of examples. If you want, I can tell you. We can think of them. There are a lot of examples where people have become overconfident and they have finally, eventually, completely lost. So likewise, to seek the safest place in the house. So now he is looking for a place to hide because he has become a believer. The non-believer becomes a believer. And in the in time to come, in, a, in, a, in the next two lines, 
invisible becomes visible. The cupboard is strong. He creeps inside. That is also within inverted commas. He goes inside thinking that the cupboard is strong enough to protect him from this oncoming enemy. Here the writer uses within brackets because the writer's intervention takes place in the poem. He come, the author comes out and describes his inner feelings. What are his inner feelings? This, this cupboard is strong. It is strong enough to protect me. So that is why he goes inside. But what happens? When he goes inside, a voice breathes softly. A voice, a voice breathes softly. He hears something. How do you do? I am the ghost. The ghost is there inside the cupboard. Where has he gone? He has gone into the ghost domain to protect himself. He has entered the place where the ghost is. What to? To protect himself. It is very interesting to see here, rather than ghost trying to fight with this man or make him afraid or destroy him completely, he welcomes the person in a very polite manner. I am the ghost. Pray, who are you? He says, hi, how are you? I am the ghost. So, the non-believer is warmly welcomed by the Ghost. So this is ironical because you and I were eagerly waiting until the man is completely destroyed by the ghost to see that the man is completely destroyed by the ghost. But what does the ghost do? Rather than completely destroying the man, the ghost very warmly welcomes the non-believer. Hey, who are you? How do you do? Where are you going? What's your name? Likewise, uh, it's, 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 uh, he is given a very warm welcome, very polite welcome by the ghost. But the man has completely lost his confidence. He has given up everything and he has fallen into the category of the category of believers, category of you and I. There are some important things to notify in the last answer. When the ghost appears, it arouses the curiosity of the reader as well. It arouses the curiosity of the non-believer and it arouses the curiosity of you and I. We become curious to see what is going to happen. There are going to be a kind of a huge confrontation in a very short period of time, maybe in two or three seconds there is going to be a confrontation. But it does not happen. And the frightening atmosphere that created by the writer generates fear, tension, suspicion in the non-believer's mind. And it also generates fear, suspicion, tension in the reader's mind as well. We also become curious to know what happens. We are also very much afraid to see what is going to happen in a very short period of time. So when you notify the last stanza, the non-believer becomes a believer. He becomes one like you and I. And finally, to his, to the speakers or the non-believers great excitement, and to your and my great excitement, the reader's great excitement, rather than the ghost bouncing on the non-believer and destroying him completely, he welcomes this non-believer very warmly, in a very polite manner. And this is not what we expected at the beginning, or in the middle, or in the end of the poem. In the climax, at the climax of the poem, the non-believer is very warmly welcomed by the ghost. When you analyze the non-believer's behavior at the beginning of the poem and in the end of the poem, you can realize that at the beginning he was overconfident, he was pretty 
confident about himself and in the end he has completely lost his confidence and he is one like you and I even more fearful I mean he, he has completely lost his confidence that he behaves in a very meek and mild manner like a rat so his behavior at the beginning and in the end is very contrasting so this contrasting behavior generates a lot of humor in the poem and rather than dealing with the humorous aspects of the poem we see whether now this poem is it a very serious poem or a humorous poem more likely it's a humorous poem it's a it, it, it takes place in a gothic atmosphere but it's a rather a humorous poem but it also has a serious message as well it criticizes the boastful nature of human beings human beings are very boastful they say that they can do this they can do that and they talk very highly about themselves but in when it comes to real life situations they become one like this uh, non-believer they, they behave like this non-believer so the writer criticizes this nature of the human beings the most important uh, humorous factor is that he calls the ghost as a silly joker but then finally he tries to save his life from a silly joker right so who becomes a silly joker is uh, very interesting to know is uh, the non-believer he himself becomes a silly joker in the end uh, when it comes to the poetic techniques the first poetic technique that you can observe in this poem is it's a narrative poem uh, when you think of narrative poems there are first person narrative poems that means the narrator himself is describing his own experiences but here in this particular poem the narrator comes out from time to time but he describes somebody else's experiences so we call this poem a third person narrative poem and when you look at the poem you see that the poem is presented now rather than presenting it in the form of a poem it is presented in the form of a drama the things that happen in the poem are more dramatic almost cinematic the, the presence of the ghost the exits exist and entrance of the ghost and on then the, the, the behavior of the non-believer the way he challenged the people the way he left him and how he reacted to these the ghostly happenings they all are very dramatic so the poem rather than presenting it in the form of a poem or song or whatever it is it is presented in the form of a drama so we call it a call, call that it has a dramatic presentation as i have just told you as i have just told you the poem is full of visual imagery for example the the way he challenged the people leave me here to spend the night then uh, the his reactions towards various kinds of sounds he hears they all generate uh, visual imageries in the reader's mind while generating visual imageries the speech how to call it generates an auditory imagery it's an auditory imagery and the personification that comes in the end we have the ghost talks we know that the ghost we don't we don't know whether the ghost can talk or not but generally the human beings can talk but here the ghost the, the voice breathes softly the ghost is talking so it's a personification a personification is also used by the writer in order to make this poem more interesting and more humorous as well the hunchback moon screech owl calling what is it is it a simile or a metaphor hunchback moon is a metaphor and tat tat tatil tatil when i pronounce these words you understand that no wonder those are alliterations Finally, at the end of the poem, what do you see? 
he becomes afraid of the ghost so he creeps into a place where he can save his life so that there the ghost appears that is the climax of the poem climax is the next uh, poetic technique used by the writer at the beginning we were waiting to see a kind of a confrontation in the end because the cue says that this is about a sad story of a man who did not believe in ghosts so we are going to observe this sad story but rather than becoming a sad story it's in a way it's sad but it becomes very humorous why rather than ghost making the man completely lose himself he says how are you and the ghost he welcomes so this is a very ironical but these are the poetic techniques some of the poetic techniques adopted by the writer and apart from these things you have the simple language uh, rhyming couplets and so many other poetic techniques as well but these are the most important techniques adopted by the writer in the process of conveying the idea to the reader uh, in this poem now today we have come to the conclusion of this uh, discussion and i, I suppose to i am thinking of having another discussion in order to talk about the humorous aspects of this poem so oh, why do we call the poem two's company a humorous one let's have a look at that uh, particular aspect later and um, we conclude the today's lesson so thank you very much for watching